The T-54 and T-55 tanks are a series of Soviet main battle tanks introduced in the years following the Second World War. The first T-54 prototype was completed at Nizhny Tagil by the end of 1945. Initial production ramp-up settled for 1947 at Nizhny Tagil, and 1948 for Kharkov were halted and curtailed as many problems were uncovered. The T-34-85 still accounted for 88% of production through the 50s. The T-54 eventually became the main tank for armored units of the Soviet Army, armies of the Warsaw Pact countries, and many others. T-54S and T-55S have been involved in many of the world's armed conflicts since the later part of the 20th century. The T-54-55 series eventually became the most produced tank in military history. Estimated production numbers for the series range from 86,000 to 100,000. They were replaced by the T-62, T-64, T-72, T-80, T-90, and soon, T-14 tanks in the Soviet and Russian armies, but remain in use by up to 50 other armies worldwide, some having received sophisticated retrofitting. During the Cold War, Soviet tanks never directly faced their NATO adversaries in combat in Europe. However, the T-54-55's first appearance in the West around the period of the 1950s, then the beginning of the Cold War, spurred the United Kingdom to develop a new tank gun, the Royal Ordnance L-7, and the United States to develop the M-60 Patton. Development History Predecessors, T-34 and T-44 the Soviet T-34 medium tank of the 1940s is considered to have the best balance of firepower, F-34 tank gun 76.2 mm gun, protection and mobility for its cost of any tank of its time in the world. Its development never stopped throughout the Second World War and it continued to perform well, however, the designers could not incorporate the latest technologies or major developments as vital tank production could not be interrupted during wartime. In 1943, the Morozov Design Bureau resurrected the pre-war T-34M development project and created the T-44 tank. Thanks to a space-efficient torsion bar suspension, a novel transverse engine mount, and the removal of the hull machine gunner's crew position, the T-44 had cross-country performance at least as good as the T-34, but with substantially superior armor and a much more powerful 85mm gun. By the time the T-44 was ready for production, the T-34 had also been modified to fit the same gun. Although the T-44 was superior in most other ways, by this time T-34 production was in full swing and the massive numbers of T-34s being built offset any advantage to smaller numbers of a superior design. The T-44 was produced in only small numbers, around 2,000 being completed during the war. Instead, the designers continued to use the design as the basis for further improved guns, experimenting with a 122mm design, but later deciding a 100mm gun was a better alternative. Prototypes Efforts to fit the 100mm gun to the T-44 demonstrated that small changes to the design would greatly improve the combination. The main issue was a larger turret ring, which suggested slightly enlarging the hull. A prototype of the new design, about 40 cm, 16 in, longer and only 10 cm wider, was completed in 1945. This model looked almost identical to the original T-44, albeit with a much larger gun. In testing, there were numerous drawbacks that required correction and many alterations that had to be made to the vehicle's design. It was decided to begin serial production of the new vehicle and the vehicle officially entered service on April 29, 1946. It would go into production in Nizhny Tagil in 1947 and Kharkov in 1948. T-54 Production of the initial series of T-54S began slowly as 1,490 modifications were made. The Red Army received a tank that was superior to World War II designs and theoretically better than the newest tanks of potential opponents. The 100mm gun fired BR-412 series full-caliber APHE ammunition, which had superior penetration capability when compared to the T-34 that it replaced. The serial production version, designated T-54-1, 
differed from the second T-54 prototype. It had thicker hull armor, 80mm on the sides, 30mm on the roof and 20mm on the bottom. As production ramped up, quality problems emerged. Production was stopped and an improved T-54-2, OB Unite 137R, version was designed. Several changes were made and a new turret was fitted. The new dome-shaped turret with flat sides was inspired by the turret from the IS-3 heavy tank, it is similar to the later T-54 turret but with a distinctive overhang at the rear. It also had a shorter bustle. The fender machine guns were removed in favor of a single bow-mounted machine gun. The transmission was modernized and the track was widened to 580 mm. The T-54-2 entered production in 1949, at Stalin Ural Tank Factory No. 183, Ural Vagonzavod. In 1951, a second modernization was made, designated T-54-3, OB Unite 137SH, which had a new turret with outside undercuts, as well as the new TSH-2-22 telescopic gunner's sight instead of the TSH-20. The tank featured the TDA smoke generating system. A command version was built, the T-54K, Komandersky, with the second R-113 radio. T-54A and T-54B In the beginning of the 1950s, the personnel of the OKB-520 Design Bureau of the Stalin Ural Tank Factory No. 183, Ural Vagonzavod, had been changed considerably. Morozov was replaced by Kolsnikow, who in turn was replaced by Leonid N. Kartsev in March 1953. The first decision of the new designer was to fit the 100mm D-10T tank gun with the STP-1 Gorizont vertical stabilizer. The new tank gun received the designation D-10TG and was fitted into the T-54S turret. The new tank received night vision equipment for the driver and was designated T-54A, OB Unit 137G. Originally, this had a small muzzle counterweight, which was later replaced with a fume extractor. It was equipped with an OPVT weighting snorkel, the TSH-2A22 telescopic sight, TVN-1 infrared driver's periscope and IR headlight, a new R-113 radio, multi-stage engine air filter and radiator controls for improved engine performance, an electrical oil pump, a bilge pump, an automatic fire extinguisher and extra fuel tanks. The tank officially entered production in 1954 and service in 1955. It served as a basis for T-54 AK command tank, with additional R-112 radio set, front-line tanks were equipped with R-113 radio set, TNA-2 navigational device, ammunition load for the main gun decreased by 5 rounds and the AB-1P-30 charging unit, which was produced in small numbers. In October 1954 a T-54A tank, designated as T-54M, OB Unite 139, served as a test bed for new D-54T and D-54TS 100mm smoothbore guns and Rajaga and Malniya stabilization systems, which were later used in the T-62. These were not completely successful, so further T-55 development continued to use the D-10 series guns. It was fitted with V-54-6 engine developing 581 HP, 433 kilowatts. It never went into production. A new version, based on T-54A, designated T-54B, OB Unite 137G2, was designed in 1955. It was fitted with a new 100mm D-10T-2S tank gun with STP-2 Cyclone 2 plane stabilizer. It entered production in 1957. During the last four months of production, the new tanks were equipped with an L2 Luna infrared searchlight, a TPN 1-22-11 IR gunner's sight, and an OU3 IR commander's searchlight. Modern APFST's ammunition was developed, dramatically enhancing the penetrative performance of the gun to keep it competitive with NATO armor developments. T-54B served as the basis for T-54BK command tank which had exactly the same additional equipment as the T-54AK command tank. T-55 
Trials with nuclear weapons showed that AT-54 could survive a 215 kT nuclear charge at a range of more than 300 meters, 980 feet, from the epicenter, but the crew only had a chance of surviving at 700 meters, 2,300 feet. It was decided to create an NBC, nuclear, biological, and chemical, protection system which would start working 0.3 seconds after detecting gamma radiation. The task of creating a basic pause, Protovotum Nayazishkata, NBC protection system offering protection against the blast of a nuclear explosion and, radioactive, particulate filtration, but not against external gamma radiation or gas, was given to the KB-60 Design Bureau in Kharkov and was completed in 1956. The documentation was sent to Ural Vagonzavod. It was decided to increase the tank's battle capabilities by changing the tank's construction and introducing new production technologies. Many of those changes were initially tested on the T-54M, OB Unite 139. The tank was fitted with the new V-55 12-cylinder 4-stroke 1-chamber 38.88-liter water-cooled diesel engine developing 581 HP, 433 kilowatts. Greater engine power was accomplished by increasing the pressure of the fuel delivery and charging degree. The designers planned to introduce a heating system for the engine compartment and MC1 diesel fuel filter. The engine was to be started pneumatically with the use of an AK-150S charger and an electric starter. This eliminated the need for the tank to carry a tank filled with air. To allow easier access during maintenance and repairs, it was decided to change hatches over the engine compartment. To increase the operational range, 300 liters, 66 imp gal, 79 US gal, fuel tanks were added to the front of the hull, increasing the overall fuel capacity to 680 liters, 150 imp gal, 180 US gal. The ammunition load for the main gun was increased from 34 to 45, with 18 shells stored in so-called wet containers located in hull fuel tanks. The concept for which came from Kartsafe's cancelled OB Unite 140. The ammunition load included high explosive fragmentation and anti tank rounds, and designers also planned to introduce the BK 5M heat rounds, which penetrated 390 mm, 15 in, thick armor. The TPKU commander's vision device was replaced by either the B Cub or TPKU 2B. The gunner received a TNP 165 vision device. The loader's hatch mounted 12.7 mm DSHK anti aircraft heavy machine gun was dropped, because it was deemed worthless against high performance jets. The tank was supposed to be equipped with the Rosa fire protection system. The tank had a thicker turret casting and the improved two plane gun stabilization system from the T 54B, as well as night vision fighting equipment. To balance the weight of the new equipment, the armor on the back of the hull was thinned slightly. The T-55 was superior to the IS-2-IS-3-T-10 heavy tanks in many respects, including the rate of fire of the gun, at least four compared to fewer than three rounds per minute. Despite somewhat thinner frontal turret armor, 200 mm, 7.9 in, instead of 250 mm, 9.8 in, it compared favorably with the IS-3, thanks to its improved anti-tank gun and better mobility. Heavy tanks soon fell from favor, with only 350 IS 3S produced. The old model of highly mobile medium tanks and heavily armored heavy tanks was replaced by a new paradigm, the main battle tank. Parallel developments in the West would produce similar results. Kartsafe combined all the ongoing improvements being offered, or planned, on the T-54 into one design. This became the OB Unite 155 and entered production at Ural Vagonzavod January 1, 1958 as the T-55. It was accepted for service with the Red Army on May 8. It suffered a significant lapse in one area, there was no anti-aircraft machine gun, which had been present on the T-54. After 1959, it served as a basis for the T-55K command tank which was equipped with an additional R-112 radio set an AB-1P-30 fuel-powered accumulator charging unit, and TPN-1-22-11 night vision sight. 
All this additional equipment made it necessary to decrease the ammunition load for the main gun to 37 rounds and eliminate the bow machine gun. In the beginning of the 1960s, AT-55K was experimentally fitted with a URAN TV relay apparatus for battlefield surveillance. The tank was fitted with an external camera, the picture from which was relayed to a receiver in a BTR-50 PU command vehicle. There was an observation camera mounted on a folding mast which was in turn mounted on a UAZ-69 car. The range within which the picture could be relayed varied between 10 and 30 kilometers, 6.2 and 18.6 miles. In 1961, AT-55 tank was used to test the Almaz TV complex, which was supposed to replace the standard observation devices right after a nuclear explosion or while fording a body of water. There was a camera mounted on the hull for the driver and two cameras mounted on the turret, one for aiming and one for observation, and the picture from the cameras was relayed to two control screens. The tank had the front hull fuel tanks and bow machine gun removed. The commander was seated in the driver's usual position while the driver sat next to him. The cameras allowed battlefield observation and firing during daytime at ranges between 1.5 and 2 kilometers, 0.93 and 1.24 miles. Because of the low quality of the equipment, the trials gave negative results. In the beginning of the 1960s, the OKB-29 Design Bureau in Omsk was working on adapting the tank to use a GTD-3T gas turbine engine developing 700 HP, 522 kilowatts. One T-55 tank fitted with this gas turbine engine passed trials but was deemed unsatisfactory and the design did not go into production. The Omsk OKB-29 group tested three experimental T-55 tanks, designated ob 612 between 1962 and 1965 that were fitted with an automatic gearbox controlled by electro-hydraulic systems. The trials found that such gearboxes were prone to frequent breakdowns in tanks. At the same time the OB Unite 155ML, AT-55 fitted with a launcher for 39M14 Malyutka, NATO code, at 3 Sagar, ATGMs mounted on the rear of the turret, was tested. Along with standard tanks a flamethrower armed version was designed, designated to 55, OB Unite 482, which was produced until 1962. It was fitted with 460 liter tanks filled with flammable liquid instead of the frontal hull fuel tanks. The flamethrower replaced the coaxial machine gun. This was a much better way to mount a flamethrower than in the experimental OB Unite 483, based on the T-54 tank where the flamethrower replaced the main gun. To 55 flamethrower tanks were withdrawn from service in 1993. T-55A In 1961, development of improved NBC protection systems began. The goal was to protect the crew from fast neutrons, adequate protection against gamma radiation was provided by the thick armor and a pause basic NBC protection system. The POV plasticized lead anti-radiation lining was developed to provide the needed protection. It was installed in the interior, requiring the driver's hatch and the combings over the turret hatches to be noticeably enlarged. This liner had the added benefit of protecting the crew from fragments of penetrated armor. The tank was equipped with a full pause slash FVU chemical filtration system. The coaxial 7.62 mm SGMT machine gun was replaced by a 7.62 mm packet machine gun. The hull was lengthened from 6.04 m to 6.2 m. The hull machine gun was removed, making space for six more main gun rounds. These changes increased the weight of the vehicle to 38 tons. The design work was done by OKB 520 Design Bureau of Ural Vagon Zavod under the leadership of Leonid N. Kartsev. The T-55A served as the basis for the T-55AK command tank. T-54 T-55 Upgrades In its long service life, the T-55 has been upgraded many times. Early T-55S were fitted with a new TSH-2B 32P site. In 1959, some tanks received mountings for the PT-55 mine clearing system or the BTU-BTU-55 plow. In 1967, the improved BM-8 APDS round, 
which could penetrate 275 mm thick armor at a range of 2 km, was introduced. In 1970, new and old T-55 tanks had the loader's hatch modified to mount the 12.7 mm DSHK machine gun, to deal with the threat of attack helicopters. Starting in 1974, T-55 tanks received the KTD-1 or KTD-2 laser range finder in an armored box over the mantelet of the main gun, as well as the R-123 or R-123M radio set. Simultaneously, efforts were made to modernize and increase the lifespan of the drive train. During production, the T-55A was frequently modernized. In 1965, a new track was introduced that could be used for between 2,000 km and 3,000 km, which was twice the range of the old track. It required a new drive sprocket, with 14 teeth instead of 13. Since 1974, T-55A tanks were equipped with a KTD-1 Nawa range finder and a TSZS-32 PM sight. All T-55A tanks were equipped with the TPN-1-22-11 night sight. The R-113 radio set was replaced by a R-123 radio set. Late production models had rubber side skirts and a driver's windshield for use during longer stints. T-54 and T-55 tanks continued to be upgraded, refitted and modernized into the 1990s. Advances in armor piercing and heat ammunition would improve the gun's anti-tank capabilities in the 1960s and 1980s. A wide array of upgrades in different price ranges are provided by many manufacturers in different countries, intended to bring the T-54-55 up to the capabilities of newer MBTs, at a lower cost. Upgrades include new engines, explosive reactive armor, new main armaments such as 120mm or 125mm guns, active protection systems, and fire control systems with range finders or thermal sights. These improvements make it a potent main battle tank, MBT, for the low-end budget, even to this day. One of these upgrade packages was produced by Cadillac Gage Textron and a prototype named the Jaguar was produced. The Jaguar looked quite different from its predecessors. A newly designed turret was formed by flat armor plates installed at different angles. The hull top was new. The engine compartment and fuel tanks on the shelves over the tracks were armor-protected. The Soviet-made 100mm gun was replaced with the American M68 105mm rifled gun fitted with a thermal sleeve. A Marconi fire control system which was originally developed for the American light tank Stingray was fitted. The vehicle incorporated a Cadillac gauge weapon stabilizer and gunner's sight equipped with an integral laser range finder. The power pack inherited by the Jaguar from the Stinger underwent only minor alterations and comprised the Detroit Diesel 8V92TA engine and XTG411 automatic transmission. In 1989, two Jaguar tanks were manufactured. The chassis were provided by PRC, while the hull tops, turrets and power plants were manufactured by Cadillac Gage Textron. Another prototype upgrade package was produced by Teledyne Continental Motors now General Dynamics Land Systems, for the Egyptian Army and was known as the T-54E. After further modifications and trials it was sent into mass production and received the designation Ramses II. As late as 2013, Ukrainian companies were reportedly developing T-55 main battle tank upgrades targeting the export market. The Type 59 is still in production, in several variants. Description the T-54 and T-55 have a cabin layout shared with many post-World War II tanks, with the fighting compartment in the front, engine compartment in the rear, and a dome-shaped turret in the center of the hull. The driver's hatch is on the front left of the hull roof. The commander is seated on the left, with the gunner to his front and the loader on the right. The tank's suspension has the drive sprocket at the rear, and dead track. Engine exhaust is on the left fender. There is a prominent gap between the first and second road wheel pairs, a distinguishing feature from the T-62, which has progressively larger spaces between road wheels towards the rear. The T-54 and T-55 tanks are outwardly very similar and difficult to distinguish visually. 
Many T54s were also updated to T55 standards, so the distinction is often downplayed with the collective name T54-55. Soviet tanks were factory overhauled every 7,000 km and often given minor technology updates. Many states have added or modified the tank's equipment, India, for example, affixed fake fume extractors to its T-54S and T-55S so that its gunners would not confuse them with Pakistani Type 59s. The older T-54 can be distinguished from the T-55 by a dome-shaped ventilator on the front right of the turret and a driver-operated SGM T-7.62 mm machine gun mounted to fire through a tiny hole in the center of the hull's front. Early T-54S lacked a gun fume extractor, had an undercut at the turret's rear, and a distinctive pig snout gun mantelet. Advantages and Drawbacks The T-54-55 tanks are mechanically simple and robust. They are very simple to operate compared to Western tanks, and do not require a high level of training or education in their crew members. The T-54-55 is a relatively small main battle tank, presenting a smaller target for its opponents to hit. The tanks have good mobility thanks to their relatively light weight, which permits easy transport by rail or flatbed truck and allows crossing of lighter bridges, wide tracks, which give lower ground pressure and hence good mobility on soft ground, a good cold weather startup system and a snorkel that allows river crossings. According to Zalaga, by the standards of the 1950s, the T-54 was an excellent tank combining lethal firepower excellent armor protection and good reliability while remaining a significantly smaller and lighter tank than its NATO contemporaries the US M48 Patton tank and the British Centurion tank. The 100mm D10T tank gun of the T-54 and the T-55 was also more powerful than its Western counterparts at that time, the M48 Patton initially carried a 90mm tank gun and the Centurion MK3 carried the 20-pounder, 84mm, tank gun. This advantage lasted until the T-54 began to be countered by newer Western developments like the M-60 main battle tank and upgraded Centurions and M-48 patterns using the 105mm rifled M-68 or Royal Ordnance L-7 gun. Due to the lack of a sub-caliber round for the 100mm gun, and the tank's simple fire control system, the T-54-55 was forced to rely on heat-shaped charge ammunition to engage tanks at long range well into the 1960s, despite the relative inaccuracy of this ammunition at long ranges. The Soviets considered this acceptable for a potential European conflict, until the development of composite armor began reducing the effectiveness of heat warheads and sabo rounds were developed for the D-10T gun. Nevertheless, T-54-55 tanks had their drawbacks. Small size is achieved at the expense of interior space and ergonomics, which causes practical difficulties, as it constrains the physical movements of the crew and slows operation of controls and equipment. This is a common trait of most Soviet tanks and hence height limits were set for certain tank crew positions in the Soviet army, whereas other armies may not include crew member height limits as standards. The low turret profile of the tanks prevents them from depressing their main guns by more than 5 degrees since the breech would strike the ceiling when fired, which limits the ability to cover terrain by fire from a hull-down position on a reverse slope. As in most tanks of that generation, the internal ammunition supply is not shielded, increasing the risk that any enemy penetration of the fighting compartment could cause a catastrophic secondary explosion. The T-54 lacks NBC protection a revolving turret floor, which complicated the crew's operations, and early models lacked gun stabilization. All of these problems were corrected in the otherwise largely identical T-55 tank. Together, the T-54-55 tanks have been manufactured in the tens of thousands, and many still remain in reserve, or even in frontline use among lower technology fighting forces. Abundance and age together make these tanks cheap and easy to purchase. While the T-54-55 is not a match for a modern main battle tank, armor and ammunition upgrades can dramatically improve the old vehicle's performance to the point that it cannot be dismissed on the battlefield. Production History Soviet Union T-54-1 production was slow at first, 
as only three vehicles were built in 1946 and 22 in 1947. 285 T-54-1 tanks were built in 1948 by Stalin Ural Tank Factory No. 183, Ural Vagon Zavod, by then it had completely replaced T-44 production at Ural Vagon Zavod, and Kharkov Diesel Factory No. 75, KHPZ. Production was stopped because of a low level of production quality and frequent breakdowns. The T-54-2 entered production in 1949 at Ural Vagon Zavod, which produced 423 tanks by the end of 1950. It replaced the T-34 in production at the Omsk factory No. 183 in 1950. In 1951, over 800 T-54-2 tanks were produced. The T-54-2 remained in production until 1952. The T-54A was produced between 1955 and 1957. The T-54B was produced between 1957 and April 1959. The T-55 was produced by Ural Vagon Zavod between 1958 and 1962. The T-55K command tank was produced from 1959. The T-55, OB Unite 482, flamethrower tank was produced until 1962. Overall 35,000 T-54-1, T-54-2, T-54, T-54-3, T-54A, T-54B, T-54AK1, T-54AK2, T-54BK-1 and T-54BK-2 tanks were produced between 1946 and 1958 and 27,500 T-55, T-55A, T-55K-1, T-55K-2, T-55K-3, T-55AK-1, T-55AK-2 and T-55AK-3 tanks were produced between 1955 and 1981. Poland Poland produced 3,000 T-54, T-54A, T-54AD and T-54AM tanks between 1956 and 1964 and 7,000 T-55, between 1964 and 1968, T-55L, T-55AD1 and T-55AD2 tanks, between 1968 and 1979. Czechoslovakia Czechoslovakia produced 2,700 T-54A, T-54AM, T-54AK, T-54AMK tanks, between 1957 and 1966, and 8,300 T-55 and T-55A tanks, between 1964 and 1983, T-55A was probably produced since 1968. Most of them were for export. Service History Soviet Union and Russian Federation The T-54-55 and the T-62 were the two most common tanks in Soviet inventory in the mid-1970s. The two tank types together comprised approximately 85% of the Soviet Army's tanks. Soviet T-54 tanks served in combat during the Soviet invasion of Hungary in 1956 and a few were successfully knocked out by the defending anti-Soviet Hungarian resistance fighters and rebels using Molotov cocktails and several anti-tank guns. The local anti-communist revolutionaries delivered one captured T-54A to the British Embassy in Budapest, the analyses and studies of which helped and spurred the development of the Royal Ordnance L7 105mm tank gun. The T-62 and the T-55 were auctioned off in 2012, with all Russian active duty military units mainly operating the T-72, the T-80 and the T-90. Middle East During the 1967 Six-Day War, U.S. supplied M48 Patton tanks, Centurion tanks and even upgraded World War II-era Sherman tanks faced T-55S. This mix of Israeli tanks, combined with superior planning of operations and superior air power, proved to be more than capable of dealing with the T-54-T-55 series. During the 1970 Jordanian Civil War, Syrian tanks inflicted heavy losses on Jordanian centurions. In one case, a squadron of T-55S stopped the advance of a large Jordanian column, 
with 19 centurions destroyed and up to 10 Syrian T-55s lost in the battle. By the 1973 Yom Kippur War, the T-54A and T-55S gun was starting to lose its competitive effectiveness relative to the 105mm Royal Ordnance L7 gun mounted in Israeli Centurion MKV and M60A1 tanks. Israel captured many T-55S from Syria and mostly Egypt in 1967, and kept some of them in service. They were upgraded with a 105mm NATO Standard L7 or M68, a US version of the L7, replacing the old Soviet 100mm D10, and a General Motors diesel replacing the original Soviet diesel engine. The Israelis designated these Tehran 5 medium tanks, and they were used by reserve units until the early 1990s. Most of these were then sold to assorted third world countries, some of them in Latin America and the rest were heavily modified, converted into the Exeret heavy armored personnel carrier. The tank was heavily used during the Iran-Iraq War of 1980-88. T-54-55 participated in the biggest tank battle of the war in early 1981. Iran lost 214 Chieftain and M60A1 tanks in the battle. In return, Iraq lost 45 T-55 and T-62 tanks. Another known tank battle occurred on October 15, 1981, when a large Iranian convoy was ambushed by Iraqi T-55s. During the battle, the Iranians lost 20 chieftains plus other armored vehicles and withdrew. Many of Iraqi T-55s saw action during Operation Desert Storm in Iraq and Kuwait in January-February 1991, and during the 2003 US-UK invasion of Iraq with poor results. Vietnam War In the Vietnam War, the North Vietnamese NVA used T-54S against the South Vietnamese ARVN and US forces. The NVA and ARVN engaged each other with tanks for the first time during Operation Lam Sun 719, in February 1971. During that battle, 17 M41 light tanks of the ARVN 1st Armored Brigade destroyed 22 NVA tanks. 6 T-54 and 16 PT-76, at no loss to themselves, but the friendly units lost 5 minutes and 41 seconds and 25 APCs. On Easter Sunday, April 2, 1972, the newly activated ARVN 20th Tank Regiment, consisting of approximately 57 M48A3 Patton tanks, ARVN regiments were equivalent to U.S. battalions and ARVN squadrons were equivalent to U.S. companies or troops, received reports of a large NVA tank column moving towards Dong Ha, the largest South Vietnamese city near the DMZ at the 17th parallel. At about noon, the crewmen of the ARVN 1st Squadron observed enemy armor moving south along Highway 1 towards Dong Ha, and concealed their tanks on high ground with a good vantage point. Waiting for the NVA column to close to between 2,500 and 3,000 meters, the 90mm guns of the Patton's opened fire, quickly destroying 9 PT-76 light tanks and 2 T-54 medium tanks. The remaining NVA armor, unable to see their enemy, turned about and withdrew. On April 9, 1972, all three squadrons of the 20th Tank Regiment fought enemy armor firing upon tanks accompanied by infantry, again while occupying the high ground. The Pattons opened fire at approximately 2,800 meters. A few answering shots from Please subscribe and thanks for watching.